Thank you, brother. Well, I'm going to be honest with you tonight. It's a little bittersweet for me. There are some places that I travel that getting on the plane and going home is a little more exciting than here, but uh, leaving you folks is a sad occasion. This has just uh, been such a wonderful week, and as I have repeated over and over, and not because of a short memory, but because of sincerity, I value my 40-plus year relationship with Calvary Full Gospel Church and with the Farina family. You know, on my travels, I have the privilege of seeing so many types of churches and so many types of leadership and models and visions that people operate on. But when you come to this church and as an outsider, uh, you look at the leadership. One thing when I leave Calvary Full Gospel Church and, and go back home is to know that if the Lord were to come by means of rapture before I ever have opportunity to return, that God has secured the future of this church. Your future and your leadership and your spiritual counsel is in good hands for generations to come should the Lord tarry. And if you realize that you have been blessed in a supernatural way, I don't think the Lord would mind if you gave him a hand of praise for how good he has been to you. On this last night, I want to say a heartfelt uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for such a nice hotel to uh, stay in. And I'm just going to be transparent. I dread getting on the scale when I get home. Because <laughs> every time I leave the Farinas and go home, uh, my scale's broken. And it always is broken in the wrong direction. But nonetheless, thank you for all of your hospitality, and to the Farina family, thank you for your hospitality and for all the food. And uh, you're just so so kind to me. If if there's somebody here that that hates me, thank you for your restraint. No one has said one mean-spirited thing. You just have all been so gracious to me, and not only on this trip, uh, but over the course of 40 years. And I also want to humble my heart and say that I pray that everything that I have said and everything that I have done and everything that I have shown by example and modeled from the platform and from the sacred desk uh, as I prayed this afternoon in the hotel, I ask the Lord, uh, I pray that everything was pleasing in your eyes and brought glory to the Lord and to the Lord and his work uh, alone. I never stand here without a deep realization that the ministry of Lost Lamb Association is not just me. First of all, uh, if the Lord tarries, June 23rd, uh, Judy and I will celebrate our 43rd anniversary. And so I'm thankful. I'm thankful for Judy. I'm thankful for the two beautiful children uh, that the Lord brought into our union and for Jonathan and for Jessica and for uh, their spouses and for our precious grandchildren. Uh, many of you know uh, that a couple of years ago uh, I buried my first grandson and it's uh, never easy uh, to bury a child or to bury your first grandson. But this Bible tells me that I'll have all of eternity uh, to be with that grandson one day and so it wasn't goodbye. It was one day, Grandpa, we'll see you soon. And I'm thankful for the Lord in all that this ministry has been through, that he's been so good to us and he's been so faithful. It's not just me. It's a team. Uh, Judy, many of you know Judy, but Judy gets up early every morning, and we've got a new puppy by the name of Biscuit. Uh, many of you know we had a golden retriever by the name of Hunter uh, for almost 13 years. And, uh, you know, dogs give you some of the happiest days of your life, and then they give you the worst day of your life. And I was so dreading it, not just because I loved Hunter, but because Hunter was the dog we had when our children left home. And when the children left home, my wife and, and Hunter 
He, he kind of got a little extra nurturing with the kids being gone. And being there when I was on the road, he was the reason why the house wasn't empty and why the house wasn't so quiet. And, and as I watched Judy and Hunter th- through those last years, I thought, oh, man, when, when the Lord comes, please let it be before Hunter dies because I'm going to have to put both my wife and the dog down. And, uh, but that day sadly came in December. And uh, I'll just be honest with you, uh, Judy couldn't go with me. She said, I, I can't uh, do it with the past dog. Sadly, I was on the road when it happened uh, with Hunter, and it just broke my heart not to be there. But it was sudden, and uh, I don't know how you feel. I can think of at least 25 people I could have put to sleep easier than that dog. <laughs> and L- Lord, I apologize for that. And, I know that wasn't very spiritual. But, uh, well, as my father said, you can't lie and go to heaven, so you may as well tell the truth. But I watched my wife just so uh, brokenhearted, and I know the only thing that cures that is a a new puppy. And so a biscuit came on the scene, and uh, he's he's another beautiful golden retriever and such a, a precious sweet spirit. And he figured out on this trip, this was the very first trip that he figured out what those black suitcases, uh, that, that what they are and represent. And so Judy said, every day when he comes back in the house, he goes into every room looking for you and then lays down and, and pouts. So anyway, I want to thank God for Judy. Thank God for our staff. And you'll probably never meet our Lost Lamb staff, but thank God for... Uh, Mary Ann and uh, her husband, Nate. Thank God for our associate evangelist, T.J. Malkanji. Many of you are going to meet T.J. before the summer's over. And his wife, Carrie. They have a beautiful little baby boy named Judah. In our front office in accounting is Rochelle. And uh, uh, Mary Ann uh, was away for a while and has just recently uh, come back. But also Amy. Amy has been on staff with us, I think, going on nine years she was told that she would never be able to have children. But uh, she got married a few years ago, and uh, the Bible says, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. And she just gave birth not long ago to a beautiful little girl by the name of Evangeline. Because when you work for an evangelist, you have to name your daughter Evangeline. (laughs) And uh, I was actually surprised But she is just coming back, just a week or two. She's been back with us from a maternity leave. And the deal is the baby has to be in the office with her. And so we we roll with the punches. And because when you become a mother, that's the most important ministry that you'll ever have in your life. And I've never allowed uh, the ladies that have worked in the office that have had little children, I've never allowed them to work 40 hours a week away from their home or their family or their kids. So we've always made arrangements to uh, set up some type of nursery, and, and, uh, but Amy's back, and we're thankful for her, and then uh, another young lady that was recently hired by the name of Tina. Just on this last night, I want to humble my heart and give honor to the entire Lost Lamb Association team and the precious people that God has brought alongside us to help us. Uh, your precious senior pastor, Brother Farina, mentioned to me prior to coming out He said, I want to take an offering for lost lamb tonight. I openly admit uh, to pastors and to churches, I'm the worst offering taker that you'll ever have. And I've said little to nothing. And, uh, you know, in evangelism in those early days, I always felt like a piece of meat being auctioned off in Russia. But uh, I've learned through the years as God has blessed the ministry that it's a biblical way. But I do want to say, if you're a guest or if you're a visitor, if someone invited you to come, Uh, when they receive this offering on this night for the ministry of Lost Lamb, you're under no obligation to give. Uh, Whoever brought you, they didn't bring you to be a blessing to Lost Lamb. I pray that we can be uh, a blessing to you. Uh, I am a strict believer in integrity and accountability. And the last time I was here, I told Pastor Farina that we were going to uh, use what was given to help in a work in the Arctic Circle. And we were able to uh, help complete that project. 
In the Arctic Circle, they have one opportunity to order building materials one time a year. They have to be ordered, they have to be shipped out of Seattle, a port in Seattle, and then they have to go up by a boat, cargo boat, all the way up into Alaska and either down the Yukon River or the Bering Sea and delivered, and you can imagine what the cost is just to get building materials. But the reason they can only order building materials once a year is the Bering Sea is frozen over and impassable for uh, probably seven or eight months out of the year. Uh, it opens up and thaws to the place that they can break through some of the ice, usually around uh, late May, and uh, then they have uh, June, July, August, and a little bit of September before things start to freeze back over again. So the good news is, is with the help of the Lord, the last time I was here, I went back home. Our son in the ministry, whom you're going to see in just a moment, his name is Austin Jones. He and his wife, Jen, and their two boys are missionaries who live full-time in Nome, Alaska. And they not only pastor a church there, but they do evangelism out of there because it's considered what is called a hub village. And, uh, but I called him and I said, uh, how much do we need to complete the project? And he said, uh, I think it was $4,800 and change, something like that. And so I said, I'll have the office overnight for the last 5000 But this church was a significant part of that, and uh, I wanted to say thank you. And I want you to meet Austin Jones. I've been going to the Arctic Circle for 20 years. There's over 100 villages in the Arctic Circle on the U.S. side that have no church, that have no gospel, no pastor, uh, no Christian school, no witness whatsoever. And we've been doing our best to... Uh, revitalize the work of the Lord in that region of the world. It's a forgotten part of the world. And uh, when you see Austin, he'll be the man in the forefront uh, with the clean-shaven head. That'll be missionary Austin Jones. He's a son in the ministry. He does all of my boots-on-the-ground work in the Arctic Circle. Uh, before we arrive and do our Lost Lamb events there, uh, the young man behind him, I've just had the privilege of meeting him once, but I am so touched by him because he and his wife moved to Shack Tulik in the Arctic Circle. And you're going to see a picture of the village in the moments to come in the middle of nowhere. And they have made that village with those native people home. It is dark in that part of the world eight or nine months of the year for 24 hours a day. And then they have a brief a window of summer. Uh, in the summer, it may get up into the 40s, rarely get up into the 50s, and summer lasts, what they would call summer, usually is a, a window of about 35 to 50 days, and then they go back into it. Uh, temperatures 20 below, 30 below, 40 below, 50 below. And they have to, it's called subsistence living, and don't be offended by it. If you work for PETA, put your fingers in your ears, but they have to harvest all their own food. And the last time I was there, they had just harvested a whale, and they were so thrilled to share uh, the, the whale with me. And so while I was there, I had whale lips, I had whale stomach, I had uh, whale tail end, I had whale blubber, uh, I had stuff from a whale, I didn't want to know what it was. But, uh, you know, when people move up and become residents and raise children, you can't help but realize that their dedication to the work of the Lord uh, far exceeds mine, and it, it's very touching. But anyway, with that said, uh, play the video first, and then we'll show some of the pictures. Missionary Austin Jones, coming to you from Nome, Alaska, Western Alaska. We're in the Bering Strait region. I'm here with Pastor Levi Cross. He is our current pastor in the village of Shack Tulik, which is about 100 air miles from here. Shack Tulik has about 225 people that live there. Unfortunately, for the last 13 years, the ministry in Shack Tulik uh, uh, has been pretty much non-existent. But about two years ago, uh, the Lord put on my heart, Pastor Levi's heart, to see that work revitalized again. And it has been awesome to see what God is doing in that community and in that village. 
But we wanted to take a moment just to say thank you to evangelist Tiff Shuttlesworth and all of the partners at Lost Lamb Association for their recent gift, which has been a great help to see the property revitalized there and the church building get a new facelift. In fact, right now there's $40,000 worth of material. We have metal roofs, metal siding, windows, doors, all the wood necessary for new entries, even the leveling of the property. And God has done this work, but you've been a part of it. So a very special thank you from our hearts to you. Thank you so much. And uh, just a brief moment here for Pastor Levi. What's God doing in Shaq Tulloch, brother? I'm so excited for what God is doing in Shaq Tulloch. I'm excited to see the church open back up again. Amen. I'm excited to see God's promises being fulfilled Come in Shaq Tulloch. The, we're seeing people set free from parts of the past. We're seeing souls come to Jesus. We're seeing recommitments. The, I am beyond thrilled at what God is doing. Praise God. Praise God. It's so wonderful. And it's, it's just a privilege to be a part of it and see what God is doing there. So once again, thank you, Evangelist Tiff. Thank you, Lost Land Partners. Thank uh, you. From the bottom of our hearts, God bless you. Bye-bye. By the way, that wasn't a train that was going by that whole time. Uh, Nome is right on the shores of the Bering Sea, and uh, they never turn the switch off for the, for the wind. It just blows 24 hours a day, and sometimes your kids can't go outside because it'll blow them away. But uh, I apologize for the audio, but uh, obviously uh, no news crew was up there. Uh, this is uh, the village of Shack Tulik. That's just basically some uh, every year when the glaciers go out and the ice thaws, it scours places and uh, distant lands. And that's the only way that they get any wood to burn is what drifts down uh, through the Bering Sea and into the Yukon River. Uh, they still use dog sleds and dog teams. Uh, snowmobiles break down in 30, 40, 50 uh, 60 below zero, dogs never do. That's the village of Shaq Tulik. Uh, population of uh, the last, I got report, 251 people. And that's the Bering Sea on the left and uh, spillway on, on the right. And in recent years with the water, uh, it, it cyclically, historically goes up and down, but... Uh, it's actually at a, at a level where they're wondering if they're going to have to uh, relocate uh, the village. Another picture of Shaq Tulik. This is the building uh, that was acquired by the Assemblies of God. And as you can see, uh, I'll, I'll let them show a couple of the pictures, but just take a look at uh, uh, the village and then they'll get back to some of the pictures of the outside of the building. Uh, that's the same uh, building that was acquired. You can see what kind of shape it's in and the mold and the broken windows and rotted wood. Uh, but it's open and functioning as a church. And um, how many are glad you... By the way, that's a crusade in another village where almost everybody in the village came forward and got down on their knees in a community building and gave their hearts to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. These native people are often very uh, hungry to the gospel and very tender-hearted. And it's not uncommon in the 20 years that I've gone to so many of the villages for half or a third or three quarters of the village in three, four, five nights to give their hearts to Christ. And uh, thank you for uh, showing those pictures. But uh, that old building uh, that uh, you saw the pictures of, uh, the project, uh, and by the way, it's all paid for. I'm not raising an offering for that. I'm showing uh, what you helped us to do the last time we were here. But in the renovation of the buildings, it costs a lot more. But we uh, never advise them replacing wood with wood. Uh, as you heard him say, everything will be done with metal. And so everything's being taken off the outside of the building, new insulation, good insulation, as you might imagine, and then it'll be metal roof, metal sides, stainless steel, and uh, it'll last uh, until the millennium. And, uh, but anyway, I'm just going to uh, leave it there. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in being accountable, 
And so the last time I was here, uh, you helped us with that. I think it lends itself towards integrity if you return uh, to show fruit. And so the next time I come, if the Lord tarries, uh, pray that we'll be able to show you that building completely remodeled. God's already moving. The church is already operational. You met Pastor Levi there in the video and his wife. If there are people that pray, put Levi and his wife uh, down on your uh, list. And uh, what an incredible sacrifice uh, to move from the lower 48 to the Arctic Circle to a village that's closer to Russia than it is to America. I think it's uh, less than 60 nautical miles from Shak Tulik to Russia. And they're up there, and it, it's brutal. But how many are glad that the gospel needs to be preached to the ends of the earth? And uh, it also is just a, a little thumbnail of what Lost Lamb has done for 42 years. Our goal, as many of you know, is to reach unreached people. I'm not going to uh, say anything about the offering. I'm going to leave that up to your senior pastor. I just wanted to give you a quick report of accountability and to say a heartfelt thank you. Our only ask is this. Will you pray and ask the Lord to lay on your heart what you should do? And then be obedient. Not one penny of what you give is going to myself or to my wife, Judy. And by the way, I want to be humble in saying this. If you have guest speakers or evangelists or missionaries that come through, if they need 100% of your offering to buy clothes for their kids or shoes or school supplies or gas for their vehicle or whatever, the Bible says those that preach the gospel should live by the gospel. It is an honorable thing to bless people that come through your pulpit at Calvary Full Gospel, and this church has a history of generosity. But I'm just saying that God has blessed last, lost lamb to the point uh, that we don't do it that way anymore. And so 100% of what you give will go into our World Missions account, and I promise you it will be used prayerfully and carefully for the gospel of Jesus Christ and for reaching unreached people as God helps us. And also pray that the uh, ability to travel internationally will open up quickly. I, I don't think it's accidental that the devil's trying to shut down international travel in the last days and hinder uh, the preaching of the gospel. Now, he can't do it, but I'm anxious to get back into the saddle and, and get into some of these places that we have commitments to. Thank you. Brother Farina, for your kindness to us. God bless you as you come and receive that offering. By the way, anything that's made out check-wise, make it out here uh, to your local church. If you love your pastor, give him a hand. We certainly appreciate the ministry of our brother that we've sat under and enjoyed for the last four or five days. God has been speaking directly and the word has been certainly gathering fruit, and we're so thankful for the many that have come to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior of their life. I'm not here to put pressure on anyone. I'm here to stand as the pastor and let you know that giving to this ministry, Lost Lambs, is giving to good seed in good ground, and we never, never present a servant of the Lord, unless we know in our hearts and are assured that they are men and women of integrity and commitment to carry on the work of the gospel as they've been called to do. And so I want to let you know that the church continues to stand behind this ministry, and we're going to receive an offering now in just a moment. And as you give, give liberally. If you're writing a check, you write it to Calvary, but on the bottom of your check, just put Lost Lambs Ministry, and every penny that you give will be turned over to that ministry. If you're writing a check, if you're going by credit card, if you're watching by live stream tonight, you have time to send it into the office or bring it in. We certainly encourage your faithful giving to God's work and your generosity. We believe that Tiff is a real man of God and has a real burden for ministry. And that's why we not only enjoy his ministry, but we stand behind it. So, brethren, as you come forward, I encourage you, 
all to give liberally. If you're not prepared tonight, just get into the office as quick as you can so that we can include one large offering to our brother. God bless you as you give. Thank you for being here tonight. We love and appreciate every one of you. We look forward to see what God has for us, even in the future. Amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, open with me to Psalm 33. Psalm 33. Again, don't forget your lost lamb covenants. Long after I'm gone, don't quit praying for unsaved family and friends. Uh, by the way, I asked Amy in the office before I left, I said, make sure that we have extras of a teaching. That teaching is entitled, listen carefully, how to win and how to pray for your unsafe family. Uh, many people have perhaps never been taught the specifics. There is a biblical way in authority that you pray for your unsafe family. You never pray and ask God. Because he already said in 2 Peter 3 and 9, I'm willing that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. That knowledge that God's willing none should perish completely eliminates the wondering as to whether God wants that family member to be saved. So you never ask, Lord, if you're willing. He already said, I'm willing. You'd never pray for your unsafe friends and family with a begging mentality or a hoping mentality or Lord if it be thy will mentality. There is an authority to pray for what God has already stated his will is. So without going into that teaching on the way out tonight, stop at the ministry table and take that teaching home with you if you have unsafe family or sons or daughters and uh, loved ones, how to pray for your unsafe family. I uh, didn't stop by the table. I was talking to some people in the foyer. But if you enjoyed the music, I hope you'll take that home with you. We'll be flying home tomorrow. Make that bag as light as possible. And my 62-year-old back says thank you. Uh, and then lastly, uh, young people, if the Lord has a call upon your life and you feel that perhaps the Lord is speaking to your heart about full-time ministry... I am currently chairman of the Board of Trustees at the oldest accredited Pentecostal Bible College in all of North America. For years, it was known as Zion Bible Institute. It is currently North Point Bible College and Graduate School, and uh, it is fully accredited. And if the Lord tarries two more years, we will celebrate 100 years of existence. And as chairman of the board, we have created an evangelism minor, an evangelism major, and this fall, an evangelism master's degree. And in that master's degree, I have strongly uh, pushed for an emphasis in eschatology, which you've heard me preach on Bible prophecy. I feel that in the last days, evangelism and eschatology walk hand in hand. Every preacher of the gospel in the last days should be well equipped in answering the questions that people have about the last days. I think many of you have been here this week. I took a peek just before church, and that video was approaching half a million views since I've been here. I received, and people are writing both our ministry and the YouTube channel from the church. People have been coming to Christ in unprecedented numbers. We've never seen it before. Probably before this day is over, that video is going to top over half a million views and people all over the world. Uh, a famous female singer in Los Angeles. I don't know her because I, uh, I don't listen to that stuff. But uh, her following is massive. But uh, she wrote a personal message to me this afternoon and said, I was listening late last night to that video on Bible prophecy and got down on my knees and prayed that sinner's prayer with you at the end. Gave my heart to Jesus Christ. What do I need to do now so that I can be ready to meet the Lord? And we've had calls and emails and messages this week. Never in 42 years have we had the social media response as just two videos are now approaching 
three quarters of a million views just in the last three days. So there is no doubt that God is speaking to hungry hearts in America and all over the world. Young people, I pray that many of you will answer the call of God and uh, stop by our table. I created a brochure entitled, Let's Start a Bible College Revolution. And you can either be on campus uh, or be online, but there's information on that. And uh, I am also committed to being an adjunct press professor there and uh, do teach uh, one semester uh, a year as my schedule allows. How many of you know God's given you a great bunch of young people here? If you came tonight and were not prepared to give or you're online and outside of the Philadelphia area, uh, those of you that are here, just stop by the ministry table and pick up that pre-addressed and postage paid envelope, and you can give that way. If you're online, go to lostlamb.org. Amy, in my office, if you'd begin the edit right here. As I have promised all week, I am speaking tonight on the subject of what will happen to America in the last days. And many people are concerned because America, unless you've been living in the backwoods without any type of connection to the internet, has gone through an incredible phase of fading away from the faith of our forefathers. And it seems like we are on an escalating pace towards the book of Revelation, even in the United States of America. And uh, many of you follow our, our social media program entitled Understanding Bible Prophecy with Tiff Shuttlesworth. By the way, those of you that use Facebook, uh, as of now until we launch the television season, uh, that is the platform that it originates from. So, and it's no subscription, it's free. I oftentimes ask people, I would love to be your trusted voice in Bible prophecy, but if you use Facebook, you can go to our ministry channel, Tiff Shuttlesworth Dash Lost Lamb Association. Every Tuesday and Thursday, we have a live broadcast on Bible prophecy, and if you enjoy learning more about that, it's a great resource. Then those are edited and put on YouTube, so if you use YouTube, you can follow Tiff Shuttlesworth on our YouTube channel. And those teachings are available there. And then a lot of the younger people like the podcast channels. And they're also edited in podcast format. So make those available. And young people use those as witnessing tools. Uh, what an incredible way if you have friends that are asking you questions about America or prophecy or some of the social agendas that are being addressed in the classrooms. You can just go on those and forward the link. And say, give a listen to this. Every single program ends with the gospel being clearly presented and an invitation for people to receive Christ. And this week while I've been here, we have seen the most incredible harvest of souls on social media that we have ever seen. And I believe it's just the beginning of what God's going to do in the last days. But tonight, let's focus upon America because there are only, if you're taking notes, write this down. There are only four possible biblical scenarios for America and its prophetic future. Let me say that again. There are only four possible biblical prophetic scenarios for the outcome of what's going to happen in America in the last days. And as you might imagine, I wouldn't tell you that and not preach on it. It will actually be the four points of this message. Let's begin as we always do by starting in the Bible, staying in the Bible, and finishing in the Bible. Psalm 33 verse 10, reading down through verse 22. The Lord frustrates the plans of the nations and thwarts all their schemes, but the Lord's plans stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. Let me pause right there, and I've asked you to bring a highlighter in your Bible. Those of you that have, highlight that verse, verse 11. 
The Lord's plans stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. You have heard me both preach and teach this week that Bible prophecy and the prophetic plan of the last days cannot be sped up and it cannot be slowed down. No politician in America or no political power in the world is going to slow up the plans and the intentions of God. They are on a prophetic train track and the train of Bible prophecy is rolling and nobody can speed it up and nobody can slow it down. Verse 11, the Lord's plans stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. Verse 12, what joy for the nation whose God is the Lord whose people he has chosen as his inheritance. The Lord looks down from heaven and sees the whole human race. From his throne he observes all who live on the earth. He made their hearts so he understands everything they do. Let me pause one more time. There is nothing that you do that is hidden from the eyes of God. You can close the door. You can draw the curtains. You can lower the lights. You can hide under the blanket. But no matter what you hide from men, you can never hide from God. And the Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. Let me say in the infancy of this message, I do not preach on Bible prophecy for a professorial lecture. I am not preaching on Bible prophecy to have Christians with an academic elitism attitude. I preach on Bible prophecy because Jesus Christ is coming soon. And people need to get ready to meet the Lord. As you're going to see tonight some of these scenarios for our nation. When it is all said and done, I'm going to do what I do every night. Every night of my life, when I preach the Bible and preach the gospel, I give people an opportunity to have peace with God. Because some of you don't have peace with God. You're not living a holy life. You're not ready to meet the Lord. You're not living in victory over sin. But sin is living in victory over you. And there are some of you that are very religious. You go to church. You have a Bible. You listen to Christian music. But you're hiding behind a mask of religiosity and your heart is not pure and your hands are not clean. And you need to quit playing church and come back to Christ. One of the social media uh, memos that came today was from an evangelist and I'll not mention his name. But he wrote me a note today after listening to that video and he said, I'm crying as I write. I'm an evangelist. I'm in full-time ministry, but as I listen to your message, the conviction of God came over my life. I'm not living a holy life. I've been living in sin. Even though I'm in ministry, I'm not ready to meet God. But today I repented of sin. I asked God to give me a second chance. I purposed in my heart I'm going to get back to the call of God in evangelism that he placed on my heart. And I'm not going to follow the pressure of other people in ministry who are not living clean lives. I want to be ready to meet the Lord. Pray for me. That's my desire for every single person tonight. I'm not just here to give you an education in eschatology. I am here to tell you that these things are biblical. They are happening. And the smartest thing you can do is to get rid of sin before sin gets rid of you. Can I hear a hearty amen? Amen. From his throne, he observes all who live on the earth. He made their hearts so he understands everything they do. The best equipped army cannot save a king, nor is great strength enough to save a warrior. Don't count on your war horse to give you victory. For all its strength, it cannot save you. Pause right there. The debate is continually in the forefront of the world 
who has the strongest military power. And the debate, is it America, is it China, is it Russia, or possibly the underdog, is it Israel? And that debate constantly goes on. And nations spend untold amounts of money trying to make sure that their war horse, as the Bible calls it, is fit and strong. But the Bible said that in the last days, if God decides, no nation's war horse can save them. Nobody's military prowess is greater than the hand of the Almighty God of heaven and earth. He buries armies in the Red Sea if he decides. With all of the prowess of military boasting, God in heaven reigns above all. Verse 18, but the Lord watches over those who fear him. Those who rely on his unfailing love. He rescues them from death and keeps them alive in times of famine. How many of you can raise a hand and say, there's been a time in my life that God rescued me from death? He rescued me from death not long ago. Verse 20, we put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. And that would be my advice to you in these last days. Make sure that your hope is in the Lord alone. For the Lord alone will never fail you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And though we may live in times of tribulation and a world that seemingly is unhinged and political powers that seem like they've let the inmates out of the local nuthouse out and in charge... I am not one bit worried about my future, for my future is in the hands of the Lord. If your future is in the hands of the Lord, give him a mighty hand of praise. (laughs) Praise God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, because the rapture is a signless event, and as Jesus said, no man knows the day nor the hour. That the Son of Man will return, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. I oftentimes stand in a church on the last night, as I have this afternoon, wondering if I'll ever have another opportunity to come back to this precious church and this family of friends that has been a part of our vision and ministry for four decades. For the Lord Jesus could genuinely come before I'll ever have that chance. And so as I asked you today, I ask you one more time, help me to make the gospel tonight so clear that all within the sound of my voice, when the invitation is given, will make peace with God. May none who came into this place uncertain as to where they stand with God leave in the same confusion. And when the invitation is given, I ask for the grace of God that would come and give people the faith and the strength and the humility and the courage to do what they ought to do. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12 that if we confess you publicly before men, you'll confess us openly before the Father which is in heaven. And so when that public invitation is given, may people with great hope and great courage and great faith meet me at this altar of prayer on this last night and say, I want to serve the Lord. I want to be a real Christian. I want to be ready in these last days. Once again, I humble my heart not only in your holy presence, but one more time, I humble my heart before these precious people before the leadership of this church who have been so gracious to me and to my family and to the ministry, bypass my feeble efforts at trying to preach 
and make the gospel clear. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Every day in this nation when the sun rises over our national capital, Washington, D.C., it first falls upon the tallest structure, which happens to be the Washington Monument. The Washington Monument, by purposeful engineering and architecture, is 555 feet tall. It is 55 feet wide at its base. And from its peak, you can observe the 69 square miles which make up what we call D.C., the District of Columbia, the capital of the United States of America. It's made out of 36,000 stones of marble that were harvested from the state of Maryland and granite, all of which came from my home state, the state of Maine. And it weighs about 90,000 tons. It was designed so that the very first light of morning that touches our nation's capital not only touches first the Washington Monument, but touches the top of the Washington Monument, obviously on the east side. At the very top of the Washington Monument, it is a triangular piece of 100 ounces of pure aluminum. That pyramid structure of aluminum at the very top is what the sun hits first in our nation's capital every morning. But what a lot of people don't know is on the east side of that aluminum capstone are words that are engraved. And the architects and our national capital voted that the words would be Laus Deo, which from the Latin means, praise be to the Lord our God. This country in recent years, many have stated, we are not a Christian nation as many of you have been told. But anybody from university, from college, from political platform, from national debate stage that says this nation is not a Christian nation is either a liar or they failed history. This is a Christian nation. Our forefathers built this nation upon the Bible and upon the scriptures and upon the teachings of Jesus Christ. It does not mean that in American history we have not opened our arms to people from all walks of life and other countries. But this is a Christian nation. And the last time I checked, it still says, in God we trust on our currency. This nation was built by people who left England because of persecution of freedoms and religion. And they came to this country to build a new country upon the religious freedoms that were built upon the content of the Holy Bible. Young people, I love you. But most of you have gone to schools where all of this has been redacted. It has been scrubbed from the history books. Most history books don't even contain history anymore. They contain social agenda. But I would challenge you to find an old-fashioned history book and study it. I'd be more than happy if you write or email our ministry to recommend some. But it's time that we begin to understand that by purposeful design, this nation was built to the honor and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. From atop this magnificent granite and marble structure, between 800,000 and a million visitors every single year, go to the top and take that panoramic view of the District of Columbia. If you were to look at the District of Columbia and how the architects laid that out, you will see from an aerial view that it was built in the pattern of a cross. 
and it was purposefully built to represent the cross of Jesus Christ. The White House is on the north of the cross. The Jefferson Memorial is on the south of the cross. The Capitol is on the east of the cross. And the Lincoln Memorial is on the west of the cross. And from atop the monument, you can see that cross that our nation's capital was built upon. Our very first president on the day of his inauguration, his name George Washington, this is his prayer word for word. Quote, Almighty God, we make our earnest prayer that you would keep the United States in thy holy protection, that thou would incline the hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit of subordination and obedience and entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another and for their fellow citizens of the United States at large. That doesn't sound like racism to me. That sounds like a president who was trying to prayerfully before the citizens of this country remind us that we are all in this together and that in the eyes of God, There is no black, there is no white, there is no red, there is no yellow. The last time I read this Bible, Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says all men were created in the image of God. This preacher doesn't care what color you are. This preacher doesn't care what ethnicity you are. Because you are a child of God and made in his image, I love you and God loves you and you cannot, listen, you You cannot be a Christian and harbor racism in your heart. It is a demonic plan of the last days to try to incite people against people groups. And if you have to put any color in front of lives matter, you're the racist. All were created in the image of God. That is not a denial of history. That is not a denial of the, of the plight and the dark pages of history against various ethnic groups. I am a history student. But above all history, my life is built upon the greatest of all books. And according to this book, every single person was created in the image of God. And when you stand before Jesus in eternity's morning, he's not going to ask what color you were. He's just going to ask you, were you washed in the red blood of Calvary's cross? That'll be the only thing that matters. Don't let the devil divide the church in the last days. Don't let the devil divide the church in the last days. When we come through the holy doors into the holy church, we're family. Many of us are closer together as family than our own bloodline families. When I come and preach here, the Farinas are not just people on a list in a Rolodex. They've been family for 40 plus years. I love them like family. I honor them like family. I love you like family. I honor you like family. And I am sick and tired of people that don't have IQs higher than room temperature trying to divide this country into pieces. On the way home, mom and dad tell your children, don't ever forget what that preacher said. Everybody was created in the image of God. Martin Luther King would be very disappointed in a lot of what we call social reform. Because his grandiose speech that he's most remembered for was a prayer that his children and grandchildren would not be judged upon the color of their skin, but on the content of their heart. Guess where he got that notion? Straight from the pages of the Bible. For God said man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on your heart. If you're big enough in faith to believe that and receive that, give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. (laughs) 
May our citizens entertain. This is George Washington's prayer at inauguration, our first president. May our citizens entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another and for their fellow citizens of the United States at large. And finally, that thou wilt most graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice, to love mercy, and to demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and pacific temperature of mind which wear the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion and without humble imitation of whose example in these things we can never hope to be a happy nation. Listen to this. Grant our supplication we beseech thee today through the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, certainly, don't leave here and say that Tiff Shuttlesworth excuses the sins of our forefather. I've already carefully said there are dark chapters in American history. There are sins and atrocities in the chapters of many forefathers and foremothers. But you can't control how people treat you. But you can control how you treat people. Grandma and grandpa, mom and dad, will you please teach that to your children and to your grandchildren? Say it and say it and say it again until it's branded deep into their spirit. You cannot control how people treat you. But you can always control how you treat people. And Christians must never be reactionary. Christians must never be impulsive. Christians must pause and ask themselves, how would Christ want me to respond to this? Because that's the true test of Christianity. Since God rules over all, the Bible tells us, he determines the existence of all of the nations of the world. Now, I think you know that because of the sake of time, I cannot do an exhaustive Bible study on this subject in one setting. We have limited time together. That's why I often tell churches, if I came and did a week of meetings every year from now till Jesus came, I couldn't begin to scratch the surface of things in Bible prophecy, let alone things in the content of Scripture that should be taught and preached. But I will tell you this, there are 15 nations that are specifically mentioned in the final chapters in the final history of prophecy. And those 15 nations are Israel, Jordan, Egypt, Sudan, Russia, Iran, Iraq, Europe, Central Asia, Syria, Greece, Saudi Arabia, Libya, Lebanon, and Turkey. Now, many of them are in the Bible by their names in that era. But those are 15 nations accepted without debate by any notable scholar that are mentioned in final Bible prophecy. That's one of the great blessings of being able to do our broadcast understanding Bible prophecy with Tiff Shuttlesworth. I literally don't preach. I sit down in Studio A in our corporate office, open the Bible, and teach for one solid hour. And people can watch it whenever they want to watch it. They can watch it 10 minutes at a time, 30 minutes at a time, the whole thing at a time, whenever it's convenient. But whether it's me or someone else trusted in Bible prophecy, you need to begin to understand what's going to happen in the last days because I promise you, you're living in them. With that said, let me get into the four possible scenarios for America in final Bible prophecy. Can I remind you that all empires historically have an expiration date? To just glibly think that America is going to go on forever and forever would be to forget common history. All nations, all empires in history had an expiration date. The ancient Babylonian empire only lasted 86 years. 
The Persian Empire lasted about 208 years. The Greek Empire lasted for about 350 years. The Roman Empire lasted from 27 BC to the fall of Rome in AD 476. There's debate concerning the length of the Roman Empire that we'll not get into. The British Empire endured for less than 250 years. The United States has already celebrated a bicentennial. But I'm just going to be blunt with you tonight. With what I see going on in this country right now, I don't see a celebration of a third centennial. The British Empire only lasted 250 years. It seems like America didn't learn its lessons from the nation that it fled from. With that said, scenario number one. As we begin, if you're taking notes, please abstain from listening to social media clickbait on Bible prophecy. Anybody on social media that's preaching or teaching on Bible prophecy and they're trying to wrap in democratic scenarios, Republican scenarios, Donald Trump, Joseph Biden, the Senate, the House, Anybody that's trying to preach on Bible prophecy and they're trying to weave America into it, you know you're listening to somebody that's preaching from a very shallow well. If I can just be gracious, read into that your own. Because Bible prophecy is not about America. The theme of Bible prophecy, number one, is about Israel and God's covenant with the Jews. There is a theology... Write it down if you're taking notes. It's called replacement theology. What is replacement theology? It's important if you're going to be a student of Bible prophecy to understand this. Replacement theology in a nutshell, now there's volumes on it. So in a nutshell, replacement theology are those who believe that because the Jews rejected Jesus, that God rejected them. And when God rejected the Jews, in their place, the church arose as the apple of his eye. That is the nutshell, the very small thumbnail of replacement theology. And I want to say very quickly, it is heresy. It is heresy. God's promise to the Jews was an irrevocable covenant. And he promised that Jerusalem would be the capital of Israel forever. And did you know that even when the Jews were driven out of their land and historically scattered to the ends of the earth, that when you study history, all of the nations and all of the ethnicities that took over the land of what we now call Israel... None of those nations, none of those powers, none of those empires ever made Jerusalem the capital. And Israel moves back into the land. By the way, it's the super sign of Bible prophecy. What do you mean super sign? Among scholars in Bible prophecy, they refer to what is called the super prophecy of the last days. What is it? It is the prophesied return that in the last days before the soon return of Jesus, you would see the Jews of the earth come back to the Holy Land, magnetically drawn to the Holy Land. Well, did you know that as I speak, over 50% of all of the Jews in the world have moved back to Israel? Over 50%. The second highest population of Jews in the world is in a hundred mile radius of New York City, where we're at right now. Less than 13% of the Jews in the world are now scattered in other nations. I don't have time to preach on that tonight, but mark that down. Because Zacharias said that would be the super sign of knowing that it's almost over. When you see the nation of Israel reborn, 
when you see the Jews of the earth drawn back to Israel and when Jerusalem becomes its capital, you will know that God is preparing the Jewish nation for the building of the third temple which will occur in the great tribulation and the rapture takes place first as I have said throughout the week if we are this close to the great tribulation how much closer must we be to the rapture of the church if all of this is over your head and I do my best to explain this carefully I understand that I've preached on this for 40 years And it might be information overload for some, but listen carefully. If all you get out of this tonight is this, please don't leave without this deep in your heart. The next major prophecy in the Bible to be fulfilled is an event called the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. The dead in Christ will rise first, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to be with the Lord in clouds of glory forever and forever, and so shall we be with the Lord. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I'll come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Over 400 times the Bible prophesied Jesus would return. The most common prophecy in all of the Bible by the law of theological proportion is the return of Jesus Christ over 400 times. And though the Bible tells us in Matthew 24 and 36, no man knows the day nor the hour that the Son of Man will return, no, not the angels in heaven, as I said the other night, it clearly says you'll know when it's nigh even at the door. We're at the door. We don't know the day he's coming, but the super sign, Israel were born as a nation, May 14th, 1948. Our former president officially recognized, along with allied nations, the return of Jerusalem as the recognized official capital of Israel. What date was that? May 14th, 2018, 70 years to the day after the rebirth of the nation. The entire book of Daniel, which is the book of Revelation in the Old Testament, is written upon the vision given to Daniel on 70 sets of seven. How many years from the time Israel was reborn till Jerusalem was officially made capital? 70 years to the day. Do you really think that's accidental? Do you really think that in the last decade, the Jews of the earth magnetically by swarms are returning to Israel? It is the super sign of Bible prophecy. I have an entire four series teaching on that. Obviously, I can't get into that tonight. Let me close by giving you the four scenarios. Scenario number one is that America may still be a powerful nation in the last days. But the Lord simply chose not to mention her. Let me say it again. I see many people taking notes. Scenario number one is that America may still be a powerful nation in the last days, but the Lord simply chooses not to mention her specifically because as I've already explained to you, the centerpiece of final Bible prophecy is Israel, Jerusalem, and the Jewish people. In final Bible prophecy, the dominant political and military powers at the end of time are centered in the Mediterranean region and in Europe, not here in the West. Scenario number two. Scenario number two is that America is not mentioned specifically in final Bible prophecy because she will be destroyed by other nations. And many eschatology scholars allow for a nuclear warfare. Now, once again, I have an entire series of teaching on will there be a third world war? The answer to that is yes. Many believe there will be a total of seven. And during the tribulation, five. We've already had two. I'm just saying, some scholars allow for the interpretation of various passages in prophecy for five more nuclear 
wars. An elderly pastor who's been a father to me in the faith is now 96 years old. And I still visit him on many occasions as often as I can. But he likes to talk to me about Bible prophecy. And one time when we were talking, he said, explain to me what your views are on the possibility of nuclear war. And I went to a passage that I'm going to read to you in just a moment. And after I read to him that this passage, he said, I agree. He said, Tiff, the United States of America is the only nation in human history that has sown the seeds of nuclear war. We dropped nuclear bombs on Nagasaki and we dropped a nuclear bomb on Hiroshima. America is the only country on the face of the earth that has ever exercised the devastating power of nuclear warfare. And this old prophet of God said in his feeble voice, and I'll never forget it, he said, Tiff, America has sold nuclear bombs. America must reap nuclear bombs. For the Bible says, whatsoever you sow, you shall also reap. Now that was his position. I'm not going to defend it. I'm not going to disagree with it. I respect him too much. But I fear that it may be so as a potential scenario. Open to your Bibles to 2 Peter 3. And let me just show you one prophetic passage that many scholars say must describe a nuclear war. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. The apostle Peter wrote, But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Now the day of the Lord is referring to the second coming and not the rapture. The day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away. Pause right there. Notice that from the original Greek text in our modern English Bible, it is translated, the heavens will pass away. If you were to study the Bible, and we don't have time to do a word study on this, but the apostle Paul said that he had been caught away into the third heaven. The Bible teaches three heavens or three atmospheres. But the atmosphere in the Greek translated and rendered as heaven in 2 Peter 3 is the lowest atmosphere that surrounds the earth. And that is exactly where nuclear bombs are detonated. Modern nuclear bombs are not detonated by impact. They don't land on the target on the earth's surface and detonate by impact as many bombs of yesteryear did. Nuclear bombs are detonated by GPS altimeters and they are typically set 300 to 500 meters above the city that they are targeting. And so when a nuclear bomb is detonated, it detonates above the city, guess where? In the atmosphere that would be the same Greek word translated as the heavens, the atmosphere closest to the earth then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise. Let's pause right there. It is discussed in scholarship from the original Greek, what is translated as terrible noise in the NLT. Why would Peter use such a phrase? Because in the hour in which he was writing, military warfare was swords, spears, and shields primarily. There was nothing in military weaponry that made what was described as a terrible noise. It could equally be translated and still accurate as a noise that causes terror. What would satisfy that in modern warfare? Certainly a nuclear bomb. Let's read on. And the very elements themselves will disappear in fire. Unique again, the word elements. When the bombs were dropped in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, the heat was so intense that humanity evaporated. 
buildings evaporated. Young people, when you get a chance, Google Nagasaki and Hiroshima before and after the dropping of the nuclear bombs. And basically what you'll see is a major city, both of which, and then the ground is simply scoured. And you see only a fragment of some of the most sturdy structure for earthquakes. But they're bent over like melted candles. Human bodies were not even left. The heat was so intense, the body's 85% plus water. Human bodies, human flesh, skulls, teeth, fillings, everything was vaporized. Dust unidentifiable. The freak show of the aftermath was the flash of the nuclear bomb, unplanned, acted like a flash bulb in a picture being taken. And though human life was non-existent, in certain places the images of bodies trying to flee or in positions of terror were left like a negative on the ground. America sowed nuclear bombs. Some theologians therefore believe we must reap. Interesting that it said the elements themselves will disappear in fire because that's exactly what happens in the core of a nuclear bomb and its epicenter. Then it goes on to say, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Many theologians believe that from the original Greek, this was translated and could very well refer to the nuclear fallout and the radiation poisoning. But it goes on to say this, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Let me pause right there. Because Peter's advice then is good advice in the 21st century. We don't know exactly when these things are going to happen. But this we do know. You need to live a holy life. You need to live a godly life. I've told you this every night in one way or another because it's the theme of what I preach in unreached regions of the world. I've been in over 56 countries of the world. I preach to people, many of which who have never heard the gospel, and I would never preach on a level of what I would call theology that I'm preaching now. My gospel is much more simplified and not because of a disrespect of minds but because you're dealing with people that have no previous background in anything Judeo-Christian. But listen to this. Peter said knowing these things are going to happen. We don't know when but knowing that they're going to happen what holy godly lives you should be living. Why? Because you don't want to be here in the great tribulation. You don't want to be here. You know, Revelation 13, I preached on it earlier in the week. Go back on one of our social platforms or on our broadcast. Listen to the message, the five political agendas of the last days. It's straight out of Revelation 13. And those five political agendas of the Bible prophesies a one world leader, the Antichrist. A one world government. A one world religion a one-world economic system, and a one-world military power to enforce it. Those five end-time political agendas are prophesied in Revelation 13 very clearly. Did you know that if you were to go on to the United Nations website and read their 2030 agenda, it's pretty much a match to Revelation 13. The United Nations 2030 agenda, if you've never read it, basically says by 2030, we need to have a one world leader, a one world government, a one world religion, a one world economic system, and a one world military or defense system. It's called globalism. And you've heard that word a lot in modern politics. All the way in A.D. 95 when John wrote the book of Revelation on the Isle of Patmos by the vision of Jesus Christ. 
He gave us the exact political agenda. And guess what has been happening in America in the last few years? The stage is being set. Why do you think throughout all of our history, this nation has been built on work ethic and pride and capitalism, and now all of a sudden they're trying to shove socialism and globalism down the throats of our young people in school and college and universities. Because we're headed for Revelation 13. But the rapture is going to take place first. And Peter said, knowing that these apocalyptic events are going to come to pass. By the way, I don't want to cause fear. Because I believe these events take place after the rapture. But I think you know that Washington, D.C. will certainly be the top target in the West for a nuclear attack. And you all are living way too close (laughs) to Washington, D.C. Now you know why I live in Maine. Until Moose become the number one target of foreign military powers. The truth is, the Bible says in the last days there will be no place to hide. Isn't that a unique prophecy? No place to hide. In the last several months in my travels, you know what I've noticed all over the world and America? Toll booths are being torn out as fast as they can get them torn out. And they've all been replaced with metal archways over the highways. With facial recognition technology, retina technology, power technology, battery freezing technology, depending on the state. Did you know that they have technology hanging on some state poles on highways? Because your cars are run, any modern car is run by a computer. And there is something that in layman's terms would be a magnetic blast. And that magnetic blast would immediately disable every vehicle, every cell phone, every digital device. And many of our highways have exactly that. This country could be disabled either from satellite or from highway or from regions or from roadways. Why do you think there's such a huge push as I speak for untold amounts of money to be given to infrastructure is now the talk of modern politics. The average American is captured on video and camera over 300 times a day. Over 300 times a day, the average American is captured on camera. Everywhere you go, there's cameras. Pretty much every stoplight you go through, every stop sign, every store, every bank, every building, every home. Many of you have ring doorbells and you watch stuff from your home on your cell phones during church. As I'm preaching, you're seeing if your cat is laying on your bed. But we have slowly become mentally conditioned to technology that the Bible said in the last days. There will be no place to hide. I must move on scenario number three. The third scenario is that America is not mentioned in Bible prophecy. Because she will have completely lost her power and influence. As a result of moral and spiritual deterioration. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 2, the Bible says, when there is moral rot within a nation, its government topples easily. But wise and knowledgeable leaders bring stability. Been a long time since this nation has had either wise or knowledgeable leadership. And just for the record, only God can make America great again. Lastly, and I close with this, scenario number four. And this is going to need just a little explanation before I explain it. America, historically, has always been Israel's number one ally, 
number one friend, number one defender. Historically, we have given, according to political records, in excess of $100 billion of economic aid to Israel. If you were to look at a map of Israel, Israel's quite small. It's smaller than the state of New Jersey. It's smaller than the state of Connecticut. It is a small little plot of land. But yet you keep hearing that the Jews and the Israeli leadership are being unfair because they need to divide the land up. There's not much left there to divide up. And if you look at a map, a large map of that region of the world, that entire region of the world are Muslim nations. And if you were to take Israel and make it red and then leave every other Muslim nation that surrounds them in yellow, what you would have in a map would be a completely yellow map with one small little dot of red. But yet you keep hearing they need to divide it up. That's straight out of the pages of prophecy, the unrest of Israel in the last days, because it certainly has nothing to do with fairness. Days ago, money from an American stimulus package that was supposed to go to Americans, a small percentage, less than 5% of that stimulus package went to Americans, Over 95% of it was distributed to the world. Hundreds of millions of dollars of that stimulus package went to Iraq. We now know Iraq took our taxpayer money and the millions of dollars that our government gave them. They negotiated for rockets with Russia, gave them to Hamas, and many of you remember days ago, Hamas raining hundreds upon hundreds of bombs upon Israel for days. Bought and paid for by our stimulus package. Let me give you some prophecy. God said, I'll bless those that bless Israel, and I'll curse those that curse Israel. You as a Christian, regardless of political platform, and by the way, I am not one bit political. I don't trust a single last one of them. There is corruption on both sides of the aisle, and I'm so sick and tired of the church being divided over politics, it makes me sick. We need to come together under the banner of the cross of Jesus Christ. Your allegiance is not to the White House. Your allegiance is to the truth of the Lord Jesus. The devil would love to split our churches and split our unity and split our prayer and split our love and split what God intended to be holy into social bits and pieces of discord. I think I've made that clear tonight. You can't be a Christian and be racist. You can't. You better be careful of any social organization that is lifting up any color as a banner. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he died for everybody. It's just a diabolical plan to divide the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing more, nothing less. That's why we take the offering first. Thank you very much. (laughs) I close with this. Don't miss it. Every true Christian should pray that America remains faithful as Israel's number one ally. I was so disappointed that as the hundreds and thousands of rockets were raining down upon Israel, our current administration rebuked Benjamin Netanyahu for not showing restraint. What if thousands of missiles were raining down upon America? Do you think the American military would show restraint? I don't think so. At least we haven't in history. You have not just an American right, you have a biblical right to defend your family, your home, your property, and the people you love. It's a part of our Constitution. But here is my concern. The rapture is about to take place. And according to 
And there are numbers of polls that I'm not going to bore you with. But according to some of the more conservative polls, there may be as many as 65 million Christians in America. Now those who claim to be Christians, what we would call in theology as cultural Christians, that number's way higher. But as far as people who claim to be Christians, who show some semblance of Christian habit and Christian character, a conservative study might put this nation at about 65 million Christians. There are in excess of 300 million Christians in the, or people in this country. When the rapture takes place, this nation will be more drastically affected than any nation on the face of the earth by the rapture. Some nations will not be affected at all by the rapture or barely. For example, Turkey. Turkey has close to 50 million people and they don't allow Christians. There may be a holy handful of Christians in hidden places and underground churches... But by and large, there are very few Christians in Turkey. And if the rapture were to take place tomorrow, Turkey wouldn't blink an eye. They wouldn't even know unless they saw it on the news. But when the rapture takes place in America, and 60 or 70 million Christians are taken out of this country, it will completely collapse this country and put us into chaos instantaneously. Justin, I'm not going to bore you with the details of the economics and the math, the money and payments and payroll and so on, but the NASDAQ would collapse. The Dow would collapse. Imagine millions of mortgages going unpaid. Imagine bills from all kinds of companies going unpaid. Imagine the cream of the crop being taken out of the word world for the Bible says we are the salt and the light of the earth. Imagine the Christian church when it is taken out of America by the rapture. That may very well be the scenario. Because immediately after the rapture, guess who Israel's greatest ally is? Daniel 9, 27, the Antichrist. America, when the rapture takes place, will not be Israel's greatest ally. The Bible says it will be the one world leader who will arise out of the chaos after the rapture. The rapture will be the political shaking that will cause the world to plead for a one world re referee. And when he arises to power, he goes to Jerusalem and signs a seven-year trial treaty. But he violates that peace treaty according to the book of Revelation three and a half years in. And the tribulation and the apocalyptic judgments of the first half of the tribulation pale in comparison to the second half. As I have taught you this week, Jesus said, if God had not shortened the days, none would survive. And so there, my friend, on this last night, from the purity of the Bible, are the four possible case scenarios for the end of America. And there aren't any others. I've studied this for 40 years. I have people, I had somebody write me yesterday, I have people write me all the time, trying to tell me that the number 13 in the Bible refers to the 13 colonies of America. And and they go through these theological gymnastics trying to twist America out of a passage that's absolute abuse of Scripture. Anytime you hear anybody try to take a passage or a text out of the Bible and carve America out of it, you're listening to someone who's a mental midget. <laughs> Lord, I apologize for that. and That wasn't politically correct. It's all right if I'm honest with you. You need to know when you're listening to fools and false prophets. And anybody that tries to twist the Bible to make America the Superman of the last days doesn't know the Bible. And when I know that people don't know the Bible on prophecy, I have a tendency not to trust them on many other doctrines either. Because stupidity usually runs thick through the entirety of teaching. Or as my father used to say, stupidity is often incurable. 
He always used to say, life is hard, but it's much harder if you're stupid. How many had a father like my father? But the older I get, the wiser those words are. And the Bible said in the last days there would be fools and false prophets. And the social media today is rich with them in too many numbers. Listen to people who start in the Bible. Stay in the Bible. I finish with Matthew 24, 44. Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Would you stand with me, please? I'm going to ask you, if possible, to hold steady. What we're about to do is the most important thing we've done. By the way, you're such a wonderful group of people to preach and teach to. Uh, You can tell that you love the Bible and have a hunger for the things of God. Thank you for a few extra moments on this last night. Every night I've been done by 9 o'clock. I think uh, because of a few extra things tonight, you... Now no, that's not a subject. What I preached on tonight, it's not a subject that you can, you can do in 20 minutes. You just can't. I didn't do it justice in the time I devoted to it. But I want you to be ready to meet the Lord. And so if you don't hear anything that I've said tonight, don't miss this. Do you remember when I read to you out of 2 Peter chapter 3 where Peter is describing an apocalyptic event that seemingly and accurately appears to be a potential nuclear war. At least the details of the verbiage are such that it's hard to dismiss. But do you remember what Peter said to the church? He said, knowing that these things are going to happen, you can't stop final Bible prophecy. It's going to happen. What was his advice? What pure and holy lives you should be living. So let me get as honest as I could possibly be with you. Because some of you, you're good people, but you're not ready to meet the Lord. Somebody asked me recently, they said, I I love God and I go to church from time to time and I've got some bad habits and I do some things sometimes on the weekend that I know God probably is displeased with, but... In my heart, I love God. And I mean, how how do you really know if you're a Christian? How how do you really know? Well, let me just give you some basic self-examination tips. Do you read your Bible every day? Because Jesus said, here is how you will know that you are my disciples in that you continue in my word. Jesus said, one of the self-examinations of a true follower of Christ is they are devoted to the teachings of Christ. How many of you know the devil's in business seven days a week? How many of you know that sin is in business seven days a week? How many of you know that the powers and the temptations that oppose you are in business seven days a week? Now with that said, don't miss this. Young people, solid Bible gold. Part-time Christians cannot defeat full-time devils. Part-time Christians cannot defeat full-time devils. So I'm asking you, do you read your Bible every day? The psalmist David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. This is the power that gives you strength to be what God wants you to be. Why do you think I saturate my messages with Bible and Bible passages and quote the Bible? Thy word. It's the word that makes the church strong. It's the word that makes a believer strong. Do you pray every day? The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, In all your ways acknowledge me. And I will direct your path. Talk to God about everything. A young businessman got saved last night and I had the privilege of speaking with him personally. I said, let me give you some advice for your business. And sir, if you're in business or ma'am, if you're in business, take the same advice. I said, every morning when you go to your office, 
get down on your knees before you do anything. Get down on your knees, close the door, and bow before God and say, God, I belong to you. My business belongs to you. Everything I have, everything I hope to be belongs to you. And so I'm acknowledging you in all of my ways. And I'm asking you to direct my affairs today. Affect my decisions today. And cause me to walk in your favor and blessing. In all your ways acknowledge him. He'll direct. Are you praying every day? Number three, are you attending a Bible-believing church with a godly pastor every Sabbath? It's one of the Ten Commandments. When God put his top ten list together, one was remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. That translates for us in modern America. Once a week, you need to be in the house of God. It's a part of covenant with God. Every, listen, every Sunday morning, God looks down from heaven into churches and finds out who's truly in covenant with him. And America and our culture has gotten soft on that. We go to church when it's convenient. But there isn't the undying allegiance to the house of God that people should have according to the scripture. Sunday's the Lord's day. It's not soccer day. It's not football day. It's not baseball day. It's not go to the lake day. It's not go to the river day. It's not picnic day. It's not beer keg day. It's not party day. It's the Lord's day. Give the Lord a hand. Number four, Jesus died for sinners. Luke 19, 10. He said, I came to seek and to save the lost. Are you praying for lost people? Are you witnessing to lost people? Do you care about lost people? Are you involved in the evangelistic and missions work in your local church? Those four self-examinations are a good place to start to see whether you're really a Christian or whether the carelessness of American Christianity has caused you to become a cultural Christian. This is the last night and the last invitation that I'll be able to give while I'm here. Some of you that will pray with me, it'll be the very first time that you've ever publicly prayed a sinner's prayer. But some of you, when you did that self-examination, the Lord spoke to your heart. And though you may love the Lord, and though you may be a good person, the Lord has spoke to your heart and said, if you really want to be ready for the rapture of the church, You need to shore up those four pillars that all successful Christians become non-negotiable with. I'm, I'm not saying if you forget to read your Bible one day, you're going to hell. But Christians should have a habit of reading their Bible every day. Praying every day. Faithful to the house of God. Let me tell you something. Many have been watching church online and I'm not judging you. But it's time to get back into the house of God. It's time to get back into the house of God. There's something about the presence of the house of God that's a little different than watching it online. Come home. Get back into the house of God. Some of you that will pray with me, you didn't pass that self-examination, but you're tender-hearted enough to God that you haven't forgotten the value of an altar and the value of prayer and you need to come back home or you need to make a recommitment to Christ some might be backslidden away from the Lord and as the Farinas have scheduled this as a holy week for Calvary Full Gospel Church on this last night God's been tugging on your heart and you need to kneel or stand in his presence and say I want to be holy I want to be pure I want to be ready I'm going to kneel here as I do every night. When I kneel, I pray for you. I just pray God will give you the courage to do what you ought to do. Those of you that have the courage, as I've asked every night, you be the first ones to come as soon as the worship team sings the song of invitation. 
Christian, I'm going to ask you to do what I've asked you to do every night. I want you to be very sensitive and tender-hearted to the Holy Spirit and the people that are sitting with you or by you or those you've invited. If there's somebody next to you and you're not sure if they've ever made a commitment to Christ, just turn to them and say, I'll walk with you. We've seen many people this week who received Jesus Christ as Lord because somebody said, I'll walk with you. And there's probably some even tonight. Young person, if you have a friend or a co-worker, somebody you go to school with or a neighbor, your best friend, if you're not sure they've ever made their commitment, turn to them and say, I'll walk with you. By coming to this altar, you're saying, I want to be a real Christian. I'm willing to repent of sin. I'm receiving Christ and Christ alone as my Lord and Savior. And I want to be ready for the rapture when it takes place. As God is speaking to your heart, you come and then we'll pray.